Hey, Glenn, how are you, mate? I'm good. I, I love your Army of Darkness poster. <laughs> yeah, everyone tells me that. And and ironically, um, there's Alex Winter there. <laughs> Bill yeah. and Ted poster, but I, I've cropped his head off accidentally, but... Um, the, the Zappa film, mate, this is, this is a deep dive. Um, congratulations on the docos. It's, it's, it's quite, it's Thank quite, it's quite deep if I can uh, say that. What level of Zappa fan were you before getting stuck into this film? You know, um, I was more of a fan of his cultural, uh, footprint, uh, than his music. Um, he, I always knew him as a disruptor as uh, as a prescient voice, sort of um, way ahead of his time, sort of almost feels like he would fit better today than he did in the um, in the 70s and the 80s. Um, I can only imagine what it would be like if uh, Frank had access to Twitter uh, <laughs> and what he would have thought about the state of the world right now. Um, and it's funny, you know, he, of course, flirted with the idea of running for president, which back then was absurd. But yeah, now, yeah. is it is it so absurd? Well, I, I picked up on quite a few parallels there, but um, I, I wonder if he would survive today's cancel culture. That's the thing. Yeah, I mean, that's, 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 that's a fair question to ask. Um, but um, I think as he, the way he um, conducted himself, um, in his personal affairs, I think a lot of, he was very transparent about it, you know, and particularly as it related to his um, relationships outside of his marriage um, and his, his wife knew about it. He didn't do drugs. Everyone thinks he used a lot of drugs and uses any. Um, and um, I think he probably lived more in a space like Joe Rogan than he would someone <laughs> that um, yeah. really did something untoward or something that was deserving of legitimately being, um, removed from the discourse sure uh how did in the beginning how did the the project come to you i mean is this something that you know you conjured up or did alex himself bring it to you no i you know it, well you the film that you watched all credit does go to alex i mean that's straight from his brain um and you know I, maybe i'm i had some um utility as a sounding board uh, i think maybe the spark of it came for me in that we had just finished i think it was I don't know if it was Deep Web or Panama Papers, and um, based on the timeline, it's probably Deep Web. And we were trying to think of what to do next, and I really thought it would be a good idea for us to get outside of the tech world to see to be made downloaded, and then Deep Web, and then even if it was Panama Papers, it was very journalistic, a lot of people sitting in front of computers. And I was just prospecting for ideas, and I bumped across a YouTube video of Frank doing an interview and being himself and just doing typical Frank stuff. And I sent... Uh, Alex an email and said, what about Frank Zappa? And I think, am I allowed to, am I allowed to curse on this or no? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So <laughs> I think he said, fuck no, <laughs> you know, not that he didn't like Frank. Um, I think he just knew that it'd be daunting. Um, yeah. and then I woke up the next morning to an email from Alex and was like, yeah, actually, of course we should do this, but I don't know if we can, because people have been trying to make the Frank Zappa documentary for decades and no one's been successful because Gail, Zappa was a gatekeeper and she just didn't think um, the time was right or she was ready or she trust or maybe didn't trust. But we, Alex knew Amit um, and we got a meeting and we went to meet with Gail um, at her house that is now owned by Lady Gaga. And I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of this house, but it's like Willy Wonka territory, like chocolate factory. Mm. This is absolutely, it, it, it's amazing. It's fun. It's intimidating. And Gail's quite intimidating too. So I was usually not nervous in those pitches but i was pretty nervous there and i didn't think it any chance in hell she'd say yes and she said yes um i think we, we found out later that she was terminally ill and then I'm, I'm sure that played a part in it because she if there was going to be a story told and she want and she wanted to have her fingerprints on it or at least set the boundaries for what it might be she had to do it then um that yeah that might answer what i was about to ask next in that um you know she and, and you know the people that that loved him didn't hold back on revealing you know some of his darker and sort of less admirable traits like did you have to wrestle with how you portrayed him on film i mean that's really only a question that alice can answer um but you know in our conversations that we had i don't think so much i mean we were telling a story about um a musical genius and a um 
uh, a, uh, a a commentator on 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 uh, culture and society, um, and um, someone that was misunderstood. And since that that if that's the film's reason for being, some of the other stuff is not relevant to that. You know, we weren't making a hagiography. We weren't trying to make a, fil a film about Frank's personal life. You know, I, I produced a film called Elvis the Searcher that was directed by um, Tom Zimney. And it was a big film. We had a lot of, a lot of runway, a lot of real estate. It was, you know, two films, uh, two parts, two nights um, on HBO, so the big platform. And everyone, and when I would tell people I was working on it, they would always say like, well, you're gonna cover the drugs and the, how he died and did he really eat peanut butter and banana and bacon sandwiches? And I said, none of that's relevant. We're telling a story about Elvis the artist and Elvis the, the musician. There might be small components of that are relevant because there's an inflection of how those things were affecting him in his artistry, but it's about the music and, and the artistry. And once something becomes, well, you might be titillated or interested in some other part of his life. If it's not relevant to the musical or artistic journey, we're not gonna touch it. Yeah, right. And and you you mentioned that Gail was the gatekeeper as well, and as the film shows, and a lot of people already know, his archival sort of you know library was huge. Um, how much access to that did she give you? Like, did you have full you know freedom to just exploit it, or did you sort of get told you could only look at certain things? No, they she, she gave us the keys to the kingdom. Um, but wow. there's daunting. Look, we did a Kickstarter, you know, that I, I think holds the record for the largest ever Kickstarter. Uh, dot raised for a documentary and all that money went to digitizing archive then we first had to raise the money for the movie because there was that much um much more than you can fit in a two-hour film and so i think that our the governor for us about what could be in the movie and what wasn't in the movie was what we could fit in the movie and then we go back to my other comment about what was relevant to telling the story of the artist and and also sort of the the cultural icon and if it wasn't relevant to that there was a sort of self limiting operation there where just things didn't make it in because they weren't relevant to the story we were telling yeah um one thing that i was curious about and you mentioned you know right off the off the start that there were some parallels there you know with today's society but you started this film several years obviously before covid crippled the world but you know that stuff at the beginning of the film about his childhood, about the, the post-war and having to wear masks all the time, there was like a real sort of parallel there to what's going on in today's world. I'm guessing that was unintentional or, or was it maybe something you added as a bit of a statement, you know, in no. hindsight? It was totally unintentional. I mean, we had, we just um, released a series uh, called Challenger, the final flight on Netflix. And there's a scene in, in before the, the Challenger is going to launch where, Chris, someone tries to get near Chris McCall and she says, no, maintain six feet, I'm in quarantine. You know, and when we were making the film, we had no idea that you know, that was going to become a touchstone that you know, we all were familiar with, but it was just um, a happenstance. Yes, right. And what's, what's Alex like to work as a director and, and how did you guys hook up in the beginning? You've made a lot of stuff together. Yeah, the origin story is kind of funny. I, I, way, way back in the early days of my working in this business, I was an employee, I didn't have my own company. And uh, someone said, well, Alex Winter wants to come in and pitch you something. And I was like, fuck yeah, of course. Like, of course we <laughs> Alex Winter. And Lost Boys, Bill and Ted, Freaks, absolutely, let's do it. And so Alex and I went into like a big conference room. I, remember, I still remember it was a giant conference room. It was like silly, there were only two of us in it. And, we, and he was pitching me downloaded. Um, which was his first documentary. And I was like, I'm in, I want to do it. But because I was an employee, I didn't have any power at the time. And the guy that signed my check said, I'm not interested. And so I had, a, I had a pass on that, but I always regretted it. And then I went out on my own. And by the time I was out on my own and could make the decisions I wanted to make, Alex came back to me with, with Deep Web. And I said, yeah, of course, let's do that. And in terms of what he's like to work with, he's, he's wonderful to work with. You know, this is a hard business uh making films is you know the it's a cliche but it's a sausage factory it's always hard it's a, it's a miserable i always say when people say what's a producer do i always say a producer takes a director's dream and makes it his nightmare and, and if a director is difficult or you, or you don't have chemistry with them you, you don't come back for a peep business and so the fact that alex and i continue to work together after all these years i think is a testament to how easy it is to work with him and how much i enjoy working with him and and I think um, he's one of the strongest documentary filmmakers working today. Yeah, I 
probably would not argue with that. And do you find from a business point of view, his name is a good selling point? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, because there, I guess for some people, um, you know, the what he brings to the table outside the documentaries is something that's a bit um, a different and exciting to them. But it's the, the documentary audience is so different than someone that might watch, you know, uh, Bill and Ted that mm. I think the buyers know that it, it's not going to translate. They're not going to, yeah. you know, someone, you know, wants to go on the same journey. They, they go on with uh, Bill and Ted based the music and they show up to watch a doc like Panama Papers. They're going to be sorely disappointed. Not that Panama Papers isn't a great movie. It's just not going to deliver the same <laughs> experience, right? So I think buyers are smart enough to um, to identify that for themselves, but I think they just they, they like working with Alex not because of his acting career, just because he always delivers on the documentary front. Yeah, you miss the opportunity for um for Bill and Ted to go back and bring back Zappa. They they went for Hendrix instead. Hey man, if I I don't work with Alex on the scripted side, but if I, did, <laughs> I made that suggestion. <laughs> well, before before I let you go, um, I just want to sort of talk about you a little bit. You've produced, like we said, so many documentaries over the years, you know, from the Elvis Presley, The Searcher, The Pentagon Papers, Undefeated way back when, and The Nightmare, Killing Them Softly. I could just go on and on. Can you share, you know, some of your story with us? How did you get into the, the business and how many films do you generally have on the go at once? Well, it's, it's, it's quite a long story. The, the short, the shortest version is... is uh one that it was, people always find hard to believe. My trajectory was changed by um, a stray pit bull puppy. I was a prosecutor. I put people in jail for a living uh, <laughs> early in my life, which is not something that um, I enjoyed doing. And it was probably not the best way to uh, affect change in, in, um, in, in the world around me in the way that I wanted to. Um, and so it was, the system is quite stacked against people and it, and as a prosecutor you don't you really can't escape the gravity of that very easily and um, I was really searching to be able to do something where I could move the needle and as a kid I dreamed of telling stories as an adult not working as a lawyer and mm -hmm. I met this I found this puppy it took me to an animal shelter the animal shelter had a need and I, I quit my job and I just started volunteering the animal shelter and I um, very soon thereafter found some happiness and I felt like I was making a difference and that was the inspiring um, intervention in my life that said, well, I need to continue on this trajectory where I am doing something, something where I feel fulfilled and also feel like I am affecting people. And so I took a flyer. I came out to, I adopted that dog. I came out to Los Angeles and I got a lot of door sound in my face, but eventually someone took a chance with me and we started making documentaries. And um, I somehow, strangely, I apparently proved to have some measure of proficiency at it. And we've, we've had a lot of success over the years. And I think we have about usually four or five things going at once, some things that we can talk about, some things that we can't. Um, and now I have a partnership with Bad Robot and we, we produce a lot of things together. Um, we're just at the beginning of our relationship. Our first project was the Challenger series on Netflix and we should have some more stuff coming out soon. Incredible. That's that's an amazing story. I mean, had you been to film school or anything you know, oh. to the, of that nature? Well, I, went, I, went, I think I went... I, the film, same film school you probably went to, which is I set, set up all night long watching movies like Army of Darkness and just watching <laughs> them over, over and over again and trying to well, them. How, I was like, how, how can we do that? Well, film school is not everything. I went to two of them and I'm, I ended up you know, doing this. It's, it's not filmmaking, but it's, you know, yeah. it's observing. Film observing. There you go. We went to that school. Right. Well, thank you, Glenn, so much for spending the time. You've got a great name between the two of us. There's three N's, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But um, congratulations on the film. It's fantastic. And I wish you the best of luck with it. Thank you. It was really fun talking with you. This is the number we always play when people ask us to play more. Because we know that after we play this, they couldn't possibly ever want to hear us again. We were loud. We were coarse. And we were strange. He had so much talent. It defied everything. You insist on very high and exacting standards. I think if you shoot any lower than that, you're going to wind up with something sleazy. Watch out where the huskies go. Don't you eat that yellow snow. He was just writing all the time. He wouldn't stop. He heard things a particular way, and then he tried to manifest them in the world. Each show was like a composition. was considered the Pied Piper of Laurel Canyon. Any kind of rock star, especially the British guys who came to town, wanted to meet Frank. 
I haven't heard anything like it before or since. Frank embodied everything. You couldn't say, oh yeah, that's rock and roll, because it wasn't. It's jazz, no, it's pop music, no. Well, what the hell is it? It's Zappa. Hey there, people, I'm Bobby Brown. The Parents Music Resource Center wants a labeling system. Frank became the go-to person, because nobody else in the record industry showed up. And my name is Bobby Brown. We live in a country where we're supposed to be free. We supposedly have democracy here. What do we do? Sit around and go, hmm. He was on a mission, and he was going to accomplish that mission no matter what. I am in the process to see if it's possible for me to run for president in the United States. It's time for a revolution. At every point in his life, he was trying to do the best thing that he could to have no regrets. Don't waste your time.